Uh, thank you, everybody, and huge applause from me to you. <laughs> well, today I'm going to be talking about pydenting. I'm not going to go too much into technical details, but what I want to explain is why pydenting is the most amazing thing ever, uh, that is not made out of sugar, and uh, why should you use it in your code. Yeah, a little bit about me. I've been doing Python uh, for 12 years. I work a lot with fast API and Pydantic, and it's completely game changer for me because earlier, so much of my code was focused on defensive uh, programming, basically checking if front is doing its thingy or not. So having uh, fast API and Pydantic combination has made my job much, much easier. And that's First, I'm going to explain you why dynamic tapping is the most awesome thing ever. We have that in Python, and it's super easy to teach people to work in Python. You don't have to set up compiler. You don't have to worry about types. Uh, I know when people are starting, explaining them what is a character, what is a string, what is an integer, what is a float, is completely insane. So having the ability to just add two numbers, get an output, or take a string, print it out, without having to go in depth about what is the types and all that stuff, is really good. Also, I remember from my old days, I was working in PHP, and there's also no typing. And uh, it's very easy to write horrible code, but that code will work. So dynamic typing is awesome. But it's also very bad, mostly because uh, in Python, we have that uh, belief that our system is super nice and we don't uh, validate inside of a system. Everything is working perfect. However, that is not what's happening in the real world. We are communicating with different applications, working with a bunch of other stuff, and we can't always trust them. Now, when I started, I was a Java developer. So my code was pretty horrible for the first six uh, months. Let's be humble about that. <laughs> Basically, for every function that was uh, adding to integers, I would write a boilerplate of code checking, are these integers actually integers, or is somebody passing me a list and string? Even though I was the only one using that code, I was writing Java code in Python. And for those of you who don't, didn't work with uh, Java, I heard modern versions are good, but the old versions, uh, for opening a file in Python, we have open. In Java, you had stream, you have buffer, and then you have a bunch of boilerplate. And even though I was working for two years in Java, every time I wanted to open file, I had to Google it. It's horrible. But you're always safe. You know what's happening. Now, I'm going to describe a simple typical Python application. We can think of it as this little uh, island. It's super safe, cozy, and nice. I wanted to add some palm trees. They didn't fit. But uh, in the middle of our island, we have a small treasure. That's going to be our database. And we are surrounding it completely. Now, database does not trust our code at all. It's going to validate it everything we send it. It's going to throw errors, it's going to complain, and that's why databases are amazing. They're not going to allow you to write horrible data, especially with relational databases. You can put a bunch of constraints on the data just to make sure that everything is working OK. So we can learn from that stuff. Uh, we are going to validate everything we send to database because we don't want it screaming at us. But at the same time, we are usually using Python for writing backends. So think of this little island as our fast API API. And all this crazy stuff around us, it's going to be JavaScript mostly, some other uh, Python programs and stuff like that. And they are crazy, absolutely crazy. I know a few Java developers, one of them is my brother over there. And JavaScript is good for many things, but you can write some very interesting uh, stuff with it. And usually when uh, something goes bad, 
it's very difficult because I'm not a full stack developer and I know very little full stack developers. So when something goes bad, you have to sit down with your front end developer and talk with them. Did you send me wrong data or was I uh, doing something wrong with that? And if you don't uh, trust, oops, if you don't trust uh, the data that's coming to you, you're gonna have much easier life. So be paranoid about everything outside your system. Have very strong borders. And everything that's going inside needs to be checked early. Like at the customs office, they're not gonna just let you in the country. Unless you have a private jet. <laughs> that is why we as a backend developer sentence can write directly to database, but front end people cannot. So as I mentioned before, a bunch of my discussion with the front end team is focused on figuring out who made a mistake. Were they uh, doing something horrible? Was I doing something horrible? And when you don't have type checking, I was working with uh, some of the legacy Django code that basically front-end developer came to me and asked me, okay, what are the input parameters? And I had to go 10 functions deep to figure out, okay, this is an optional parameter. And then basically create a small note and send it uh, to him. That is a very ho horrible way to spend time with the front-end team. When you have a proper validation in place, if there is an error, and you're not returning the error, then you're at fault. If there is an error and you're returning them, they get right away, okay, you didn't provide me this field. And you read this bunch of talking with front-end people. Instead, you can talk about them uh, a bunch of other stuff. So since we started working in Fast API, which uses Pydantic all over the place, I actually talked with my front-end colleague learned he knows how to do diving, has some certification. We talk about a bunch of other stuff, but we do not talk about API. Now, uh, before we go into Pydantic, there's a little thing, type hints, that were added in 3.6 and are the coolest thing ever. In Python, we don't have type validation, but we can hint uh, to our Python code that this is going to be an integer, and this function is going to return, for example, another integer or a list. And that's very good because myself, code I have written two weeks ago, that's a completely different person. I'm not going to know what's happening there. So if you have type hints, you're very easily able to just look at the name of the function and know what's happening in there without going into the code. Uh, however, you might be asking, okay, these are just hints. It's not gonna make my code any better. I'm just writing extra stuff. Same as documentation. Well, uh, I work in PyCharm, but I'm pretty sure VS Code and a bunch of other modern uh, editors support this. When you try to uh, send some horrible data, for example, I'm adding two integers and I send strings, PyCharm is gonna mark that as a warning. And, complain to you. And we also have uh, MyPy, which is an amazing tool that you can just run against your code and it's gonna uh, tell you you're doing something completely wrong here. And I always integrate it into my uh, CI CD pipelines. So nothing that's super horrible gets merged into production. We have to fix those errors. And introducing uh, type hinting into our program has greatly, greatly reduced number of bugs. Because you do have your tests. And of course, you're gonna do some property-based testing with hypotheses, but there's always uh, some unforeseen function call. And my pay can catch those. Yep. However, there is absolutely no runtime validation of your data. So, when your code is running and you're not providing the inputs to your code, but it's provided by a different uh, Python script or uh, you're reading it uh, from some stream or somebody's uh, just sending you post requests and you're writing that out, Python doesn't care about that. 
Even though you type hint that I want integer to be user ID, you can get a string. Everything is going to work fine, then it's going to break into database. And you're going to return an error of 500. Now, we have multiple status codes, but the most important ones uh, are 400 and 500. 400 means uh, front end to mess things up. 500, something went wrong on the server. We don't want uh, 500. Now, getting started with Pridentic is very, very easy. As you can see, we just import base model and create a very simple class. You can uh, provide type hint, uh, default value, and uh, then we just call it like this. And it just works. This is the whole code that does validation of the user uh, class. It's going to complain. It's going to throw validation errors. And most important, it's going to tell you what you did wrong. So you put this into your endpoints. And then you don't have to do anything. It's going to scream at the front end people. Now, uh, in Fast API, it uses Pydentic a lot. You can do this for return types. So your code is going to throw error when you are the one that's returning the garbage data to the front end. So it does two-way validation for anything going in and everything going out, which is super great for figuring out uh, what's going wrong. And in programming, 90% of time, that's what you're doing. Also, I did work a little bit uh, with Scala. And Scala is a very weird programming language because by default, everything in Scala is immutable. And for me, that was like, why would I make my list immutable? Uh, but as I worked a little bit more with that, I realized how much of my code relies on side effects. You provide input parameters and you get an output. But in Python, it's very easy uh, to have something, for example, merge to list function, where you add a second list to the first list and you return that one. If you take a look at the code, everything looks perfectly nice. But you can modify the input parameter. And if somebody doesn't know that, that's going to make a stuff super, super crazy. So what we want to do is basically every single time we want to avoid side effects of the function unless explicitly told. And we want to make stuff immutable because in presenting that's super easy. You can set it up uh, in the class as configuration and then you cannot change the data. You have no idea how many bugs I caught uh, by myself uh, modifying the re input request of the user. And that is great. Use immutability it, by default. Now, as I mentioned, a bunch of stuff is coming into the Pydantic. From the front end uh, people, in most of the cases, you're going to receive a JSON file that Python is going to turn it into a dictionary. And that dictionary, Fast API does a bunch of cool stuff and magic, that dictionary goes into your pedantic models and input. If it's wrong, it complains. If not, it works perfectly fine. However, on the other end, when you're getting data from the database, in most cases, you're going to be using ORM, in our case, Alchemy, and you get ORM model. You can do that to input it and get a pedantic model, which is much lightweight. Uh, it just has these types, doesn't have a bunch of database-related options, and best of thing, all stuff, you're not in danger of accidentally changing the database and doing that, which I did a couple of times in production. Now, Pydantic uh, also allows exporting data because you can't send Pydantic model to the front end. You can just call simple method that creates a dictionary or a JSON and throw that out. And that's it. Super easy to use and very, very intuitive. Now, most of the time, uh, we want to have some custom validation of the data. When we want to go beyond uh, the simple 
validation. It's not just a type, for example, uh, one check, uh, does this uh, string have minimal length? Uh, is there a certain property? For example, they have email string as a type, but let's imagine it does not exist. You can do some regex validation into it and it will uh, check that. Here I just created a class unicorn and our, what our function does is you make a field name validator, tell it for which parameter it works, and every time that class is created, it's gonna take that input value, uh, check it. In our case, we are checking is the unicorn name magical. If it's not, it's gonna create value error. If it's good, it just returns uh, titled uh, value, which is amazing. That's all there is to the custom validator logic. And in Pydetic, you can also define custom fields. So for example, let's say we have a bunch of classes that are using the uh, same uh, type of validation. You can declare that field, then reuse it in a bunch of models. And it's super great. Now, you can also have custom types. You use custom types every time you have to share uh, validators between models. And best of all, alias. This is uh, really crazy stuff that I discovered while working with front-end people because front-end and back-end don't move at the same speed. Usually uh, it's much faster to change something in the back-end while in front-end they have Q&A, visual testing, a bunch of other people are working on that. So your IP uh, can move between the versions. And a field name can change. For example, let's say here, we are using username, we changed the database and everything, but front-end code hasn't been updated. They're using user underscore name. You can uh, tell to Pydantic, this field has an alias. It can be named differently. All is good. Pydantic is gonna take care of that stuff. And uh, once uh, migration is done on the front-end side of things, you just remove the alias, and then it's gonna break but it supports transitional state. Also very cool stuff is that every class, you can set up uh, various uh, configuration for that. By default, uh, Pydetic is just gonna ignore uh, stuff. For example, here we have parent that only has a name. But let's say we pass a name, surname, date of birth, and all that stuff, Pydetic is just gonna ignore it it's just gonna take one value. We can also allow it to accept those values. So it's gonna create objects with all these additional values, but it's not gonna validate them. I do not recommend you doing that. Uh, what I love adding is forbid. So if I get more data that I'm expecting, uh, I love uh, for pedantic to scream at uh, front-end people instead of me and telling them this request is wrong because uh, maybe they are sending me some data that is not uh, supported and that is signal for them. And then when they tell me, no, no, this is actually good, then I put it to allow. You can use other pydentic models inside of uh, another pydentic model as a type, and this works very nicely. In this case, we have uh, ice creams and we have perfect meal that just includes the list of all the ice creams. That's it, this is the whole code. In some cases, uh, you wanna have recursive models that refer to themselves. You can just uh, import some future annotation and just use the name of the class. This is the whole deal. Uh, without import from future, you have to update your references, edit as a string, and it looks horrible. I love stuff that are short. For some reason, if you are feeling so client, you can create dynamic models. You have create model function, you throw it a string, and then you send a field with uh, types. It's gonna create a model for you in the runtime, time, and you can use that for validation. Um, one disclaimer, I never used uh, this feature, but it looks super cool. Pydantic can also be used for settings. 
and you have a multiple uh, environments, multiple version of the software. You want to make sure your settings are okay. So in fast API on the runtime and starts up, it needs to load, okay, this is where my database is, this is my stream, and all that uh, cool stuff. And you want to validate that. So in PyDetic, it's super easy. And it uh, has a list of priorities for reading. First, if you explicitly uh, create a pedantic model for settings and pass it, say, okay, use this database, it's gonna use that. Otherwise, it reads for environmental variables, which is super nice if you're working inside of Docker. You can have .env uh, file, which is nice when you're developing your local machine, but never use .env files in production because you really don't want to have on the server in plain text, database, password, username, and all that stuff. I've seen that a lot of times, and you do not want it. <laughs> and afterwards, if everything else fails, it will check, did we have a default value for that field? If we did, all good. If not, scream error. Basically, in order to start, you need to provide me database URL. Pydantic has amazing documentation. Fast API, and Pydantic, they are such a great resource. You can just go on their website. Everything is explained with a bunch of examples. And for me, that's the most important stuff. Can I figure out what's happening by just looking at their website? And yes, I can. And they explain a bunch of edge cases, much better than I do. So use their website. It's actually pretty cool. Now, uh, we have Pedantic version two, which is newly released, and I think three days before I got here, uh, Fast API also started supporting it. What's different from Pedantic one? They do the same thing, but Pedantic two is written in Rust, so it's several magnitudes uh, faster. Which, uh, if you're working with Rust endpoints, doesn't mean anything to you. Majority of your time is not going to be spent on validating front-end inputs, but on waiting for database to respond. So maybe your code was working 100 milliseconds, now it runs for 10 milliseconds, nobody's gonna notice that. However, if you're working with data science and you have to go over CSV and validate all that data, you are now going to have actually a very good time instead of earlier because when you have two gigabytes of CSV files that you need to validate before you throw them into database or some pipeline processing, now that actually is usable in Python. Earlier, uh, you could not drink a coffee, but make lunch, drink coffee, and then go play around while it imported some huge stuff. So that is all. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I love having virtual coffees with people, uh, talking with them. You're all amazing. Also, if you think your Python code could use some love, uh, contact me and free for consulting and stuff. So, thank you. thank you very much for the presentation. We have a few minutes time for questions, so if anybody would want to ask one, please get up, get to that microphone, and at that microphone you could ask a question. It's here in the middle. There you go. Or you come to the front. Okay. While we're waiting for the question, a little reminder for those who are leaving early, uh, please take your glasses and paper bags or paper cups with you. We had problems in the other room where people left too many of these. And if you see one left by the others, please take that as well. Your question, please. Thank you for the talk. Um, my question, so one common example, one common use case you gave is uh, validating data coming from the front end, right? Untrusted user input. And especially in this particular use case, JSON schema would be another way to do that if I understand you correctly. And especially with the use case that you gave with the dynamic data class generation, is there anything or would this be a perspective to basically gener dynamically generate data classes, identical data classes based on a JSON schema that you may already have? To basically have a native Python valid schema based on a existing JSON schema. Does that make sense? Yes, and that's actually a pretty good use case for dynamic uh, 
models location. Do you know if there's already a library that does exactly that, or is it something one would have uh, to do? I actually that? don't know about it, but it's a real cool idea. Okay. Well, that was a question. Yeah. Okay, thanks Thank for the you. question. Uh, yeah, are there any other questions in the room? Don't be shy. Ask everything. It's still possible to ask questions, but it seems that everybody has learned a lot about it and now needs to try it out at home, and then we will get some questions. But if you are using Fast API, you're using it anyway, so you 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 will be exposed to it, and then you might want to try it out in your other non-web server projects. Yeah. If you think of any other questions, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'll be more than happy to answer. I'm not a contributor to Pedantic. I just love the library. OK, so thank you very much for everybody to come here. We'll take a short break and then continue uh, in roughly seven minutes with the next talk.